allow me to say good morning and welcome to everyone that is here with us today in God's house and those of us that might be listening on the radio or uh, have tuned in through YouTube. We are glad that you are here and worshiping with us today. You'll notice things are a little different. The screen is up, so we will be going back to using our hymnals at the proper time. And we have a baptismal service that's going to take place momentarily. But I would like to share with you just a few things that are going on this week. Uh, our joyful singers are going to get together in the choir room and work with Dr. Sharon this afternoon at 4. And not too long after that is going to be Trunk or Treat. We are very excited to have that. That will be taking place out here. We still got parking spaces that could stand to have a few more vehicles in them loaded with candy. And we love to see... Uh, the children, even the adults, dress up and come by and we fellowship with the community at this time. It starts at 5.30 and runs to 7 o'clock. I hope that you'll be here and if you'd like to do something at this, there are sign-up sheets back yonder on the Narthex table. Take a look at them and see if you'd like to do something in that. Uh, jump team, they're not going to meet today. Uh, Wednesday activities, we have a special Wednesday night thing happening in the uh, fellowship hall at six o'clock we're going to discuss our 2023 budget and uh, if you have any questions anything like that uh, church members we are asking you to be there because uh, the finance committee is going to present this budget uh, in a special called church conference on Sunday November the 15th immediately following the worship service but your time for Q&A will be this Wednesday night and then we'll have prayer meeting afterwards uh, daylight saving time it's it's going to come to a close unless uh, unless the government tells me different but we are going to wind our clocks back one hour Saturday night before going to bed so if I see people in their pajamas next week I'm going to know something wasn't quite right uh, poinsettia and luminary forms can you believe it's that time to start seriously thinking about them the forms are on the table back there take them if you have somebody you'd like to do in honor of of. There are other announcements in the bulletin, and uh, Brother Kent, we, the deacons are meeting next Sunday morning, right? At 9 o'clock? Okay, deacons, you're aware of that, and the uh, Music Worship Committee, we're meeting next Sunday afternoon at 3. Whew. I'm glad to get the announcements out of the way because I'm very excited to have uh, Brother Liam Dyson, who will come and share our scripture today. So, Brother Liam, come on over here and help us prepare for worship. Tell us where you're reading from. Romans 1.16-17 I want to preach it because I'm not ashamed of the good news. It is God's power to save everyone who believes. It is meant first for the Jews. It is meant also for the Gentiles. The good news shows God's power to make people right with himself. God's power to be made right with him is given to the person who has faith. It, it, it happens by faith. From beginning to end, it is written, the one who is right with God will live by faith. Amen. Amen. Thank you. May God add his blessings to the reading as we go to him in prayer. Gracious Lord, we are excited to be in this place and worshiping you from wherever we are, not just the sanctuary, but wherever from where we are able to tune in. We are excited to have this moment. Lord, we come rejoicing because we are about to witness the ordinance of baptism. We are excited for Tyler's family and we are excited as a church family. This is a wonderful way to begin a service where it is all about you. We thank you 
and ask you to bless us as we do our best in blessing you. And as you taught your disciples, we all prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And I strongly suggest you do. You can join me at hymn 574, If My People's Hearts Are Humbled. Basically, this is Second Chronicles 714 set to music. And the tune is Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. So won't you stand with me as we sing this hymn of praise together. each one of you to our worship service today. We are indeed uh, delighted that uh, we have the opportunity to, uh, for this very special service uh, to celebrate baptism. But before we do that, I'd like to invite the children to come down, if they would, for our children's sermon. Uh, and I'm going to ask that you sit right over here on this front, very front row, so you'll be able to see everything. I see, yeah, come right on down. Maybe Miss Angie can go over and sit with them. Right there. Well, you can sit on the pew if you'd like to. I just want you to be able to see what's going on up here. All right. We're so glad to welcome each one of you. Anytime we have anything going on in our church that's special, that's out of the ordinary... I always make that the topic of the children's sermon because I want y'all to know what's going on. Y'all are smart, and you can figure things out, and you know when it's a little different than what we normally do. And today is different. It's very different. We're celebrating baptism. If you were here a few weeks ago, you remember that Mr. Tyler Granger uh, came forward, and he shared with us that he had asked the Lord into his heart, uh, that he had received him, and that he had become a Christian. And as Christians, we want to follow not only what Jesus teaches us, but part of what Jesus not only taught us, but what he did, he was baptized. And so that's why we get baptized. And in fact, in many ways, it's like a sermon. Tyler didn't know he was going to preach the sermon today, uh, but he is, and you don't have to say a word. <laughs> he's, he's in shock. We might have to wake him up up here. But uh, really, you're going to see a sermon, the gospel, because what's going to happen in just a moment after I read some passages of Scripture that tell us more specifically what uh, baptism is about, 
Tyler is going to come down into the water, and I'm going to uh, share with you that he has made a profession of faith. And then, uh, as a result of his profession of faith and following Jesus in the waters of baptism, he's going to go down under the water, and then he's going to come back up, and then he's going to move along. And that's a symbol that he's come, and that he is putting off his old life, dying to the old life, raising to the new life, and moving on and following Jesus. That's a powerful symbol. It's something that we can all understand, isn't it? So I want y'all to be able to pay real close attention uh, to what we do here in just a moment, particularly when Mr. Tyler comes down, okay? And then once we're through, I'll have a prayer, and then you can go with Miss Angie to children's worship, okay? All right. Certainly we're here uh, as a result of what we understand about what Jesus, our Lord and Savior, did. And there are several passages of Scripture that I think are very important. Uh, one from Matthew's Gospel that shares with us Jesus himself entering the waters of baptism and being baptized by his cousin John the Baptist. And then a reflection from the Apostle Paul as he wrote to the church at Rome regarding what, what baptism actually means. And then, of course, the other words of Jesus as he rose from this earth, uh, completing his ministry, sharing with us the things that we as his followers need to do and ironically, baptism is included in that as well. So here are these portions of Scripture. And if you would, let's stand together in honor of the reading of God's written word. Matthew 3, 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And then years later, as the Apostle Paul reflected upon what baptism meant and what it means. In Romans 6, he writes, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. And then as Jesus ascended into heaven, Matthew 28, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. May God bless the reading of his written word to our hearts and lives this day. Thank you. You may be seated. Tyler Granger, upon your profession of faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Great, good job. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we're always humbled when we have the opportunity to celebrate the significant moments in the lives of your children. Lord, we thank you for Tyler and for his faith in you. We thank you for the talents that you have invested in his life. And we pray, Lord, now that as he has publicly professed his faith, followed you in the waters of baptism, that he would sense 
your spirit leading him more completely than ever before in his life. That he might not only hear your call, but that he would respond on a daily basis, seeking to be your faithful follower and your faithful servant in Jesus Christ. For it is in, through, in and through his name that we offer this prayer. Amen. I thought I might have needed the stool that Liam did, but uh, I think I'm tall enough to do this. Let me say, when Tyler turned and grinned at everybody after, after he came up out of the water, man, my face just joined him. And uh, I hope yours did too, because I now my face hurts from grinning so big. Uh, I'm going to ask the choir to join us in the choir loft as we all stand and sing our uh, offertory hymn, hymn 280, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. So let us all stand and choir, you can make your way to the choir loft, please. <laughs> gift of all. And Lord, you ask so little from us with our tithes and offerings. But may that which is given this day bring honor and glory to you. Small as it may be, we know that you can take it and multiply it many times over. These things we ask in your name. Amen.
in the many ways that you give. We give this to God. And we ask that He help us as we expand His ministry for His glory. And we thank Him. Believe it or not, I was all set to do the doxology for this day, and Tyler was on my mind. He's getting baptized. And what better course just seems to remind us that this is for Tyler as well as it is for us. And it's the chorus of the family of God. It's hymn 282, and I ask, as our doxology, our offertory refrain, would you stand as we sing 282 together? <laughs> Sometimes you don't want to tell everybody exactly what it is, but you certainly would love to have folks pray for you. So if we have unspoken, would you just lift up your hand? Yes, yes, thank you so much. You know, the number of those hands may overwhelm us, but they do not overwhelm the God we serve. Amen? Please continue to remember the family of Wade Keynes. Uh, this is Brother Wesley's brother. And please continue to remember the family of Larry Bullard. This is Miss Olita's first cousin. Uh, Rhonda Turner's mom, Mary Curry. Uh, we've been requested to have prayer for her. Uh, we've just got so many names on this list. Yes, sir. Is that name? It's not on the list. Okay. Uh, the family of Jerry Johnson. Uh, while I do not know who that is, there may be many of you who do. So anytime a family has lost someone, you can but imagine the grief that they have and that they need prayer. There are a lot of names on this list. And they all need prayer. And you may think, I can't get to all of them, but God can just remember a few specifically. Pray your best, and God will hear it. As the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, tells us, take it to the Lord in prayer. And that's what we're going to do right now. So if you would, join me at the throne as we pray. God, our Father, we adore you. We are so grateful to be your children. That we have done what Tyler did today to show the world that we are not ashamed to be a Christian. Lord, I ask that you read our hearts. Hear the names that have been mentioned. 
we know that you are aware of all the names that are on this prayer list and the, the needs of those who raise their hand and the needs of folks who just kept it to themselves. Lord, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace and the many gifts that you give us. We thank you for the opportunity that we may worship. We have received a blessing already from seeing our brother partake in the ordinance of baptism. We ask your blessing on the choir anthem and the message that you have laid upon your servant. These things we ask in your most holy name. Amen.
make it. Thank you so much, choir. It's always wonderful to have uh, wonderful music, and it adds so much to our worship service. Our scripture text today comes from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, passage of scripture that you may be a bit familiar with. I'm going to be reading it from the New International Reader's Version, so it might be a bit different from uh, your particular version, but I would ask that let's stand once again in honor of the reading of God's written word. The days are coming, announces the Lord. I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel. I will also make it with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their people of long ago. That was when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. But they broke my covenant. They did it even though I was like a husband to them, announces the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with Israel after that time, announces the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. They will not need to teach their neighbor anymore. They will not need to teach one another anymore. They will not need to say, know the Lord. That's because everyone will know me. From the least important of them to the most important, all of them will know me, announces the Lord. I will forgive their evil ways. I will not remember their sins anymore. May the Lord bless the reading of the written word to our lives this day. Thank you so much. You may be seated. In addition to having the wonderful opportunity to celebrate baptism today, uh, today is a very special day in the life of the church as it is Reformation Sunday. Uh, one of those historical events that uh, has an impact on the fact that we are sitting here the way we're sitting here. Everything that we do as Baptists has been uh, touched and affected by what took place during the Reformation. That we are a free people able to worship God uh, without the constraints of a hierarchy that tells us what we need to do and how we need to do it, uh, either ecclesiastical or political. Uh, that's very much a part of the wonderful things that came as a result of the Reformation. But at the heart of the Reformation, uh, there was this question that Martin Luther was trying to answer, a question that uh, humanity has really tried to answer uh, from as long as we can have thought recorded. And the question is simply this, how do we find God? How do we experience God? What are the steps that we need to take in order to experience the blessingness of God? And well, when we try to figure that out we're trying to figure out not only who God is but what uh, who we are and what our role in all this world is all about so how do you find what God is like well through the ages uh, particularly the uh, Greeks well you just need to use your head let's be logical about this and the only possible logical conclusion is that God exists and so convinced were the ancient Greeks of the unassailable nature of that conclusion that they considered an atheist to be so irrational that they categorized them as being insane. Human reason demands that God exists. But what that God was like, well, when it came to that point, well, they got kind of vague. Uh, they weren't really all that sure. Uh, they weren't really sure whether God was moral, immoral, amoral. Uh, he was just, a, a, if it was a, a bunch of gods, a bunch of little gods, or one big God, or a hierarchy of gods. But they knew that logically, God should exist. But there were others who simply didn't say, no, you can't reason your way to God. It's a mystical relationship that you have, a spiritual relationship Therefore, you must have a disciplined mo uh, a program of meditation and prayer. And we see that in many different uh, ways throughout our world and our culture. Certain Hindus and Buddhists 
uh, carry that out uh, and carry it probably about as, as far as you can take it. To them, it's not reason being and logic being a path to God. For those folks, they see reason and logic as being the problem. It's a barrier to keep us from knowing who God is, to keep us from experiencing God. Uh, they want to jar us out of our logic into an immediate experience with God. Uh, to have God impact us in, a, uh, in an emotional way uh, to the point where our logic just goes right out the window. It's a feeling. It's an experience. And it's difficult when you start trying to nail all that down and trying to make it a bit more specific so that you can say, well now, this is how it needs to be for you to experience God. Because since there's no logic to it, there's really no pattern to it. And so it gets to be pretty difficult. There are others who would say, well, you just do what your grandpa and your great-grandpa and your great-great-great-grandpa did. You follow the tradition. Whatever tradition is, it's basically right. You need to follow that, except what is taught. And of course, the traditionalist answer is reflected in uh, some of the uh, comments like, well, you just accept it on faith. And that sort of blends this view that uh, you, you just simply have to live a decent life. You need to be honest. Uh, you need to just sort of be a good person, a good citizen. And, and if you do all the right things, then, you know, obviously God logically is going to take care of those who are doing things the right way. And that uh, traditionalist answer really seems to work pretty well until something bad happens. Why did God let that happen to me? went to Sunday school, studied my lesson, you know, those little seven boxes we used to check when we were coming to church, had your Bible, you read your Bible, you uh, attended worship, you gave, you did all those things, and then, why in the world would God let that happen to me, or to my family, or to my loved ones? You see, uh, that sort of leads us to uh, sort of thinking that, well, if we've done everything on our part, then we're obligating God to do what? Keep his part. We've been good. He needs to be good to us. And that's really not what the Bible describes as faith, is it? That's sort of a good bargain. That's just making a good deal. Uh, we're, we're putting God uh, there to where he owes us because of what we've done and because we are living the right way. So all three of those answers uh, were knocking around even as far back as the time of Jeremiah. We read in Jeremiah in the Old Testament uh, passage of Scripture uh, that he had spent 40 years of his life uh, as a messenger for God, telling the people there that were a part of the, of the nation of, of Israel that they were violating God's law. They weren't caring for the poor people. They didn't give a rip about widows. They didn't care anything about those who were uh, the, uh, on the fringes of society. They were looking out for themselves. And it, Jeremiah said, that's not the right way. That's not what the Scriptures tell us. And what did they say? Well, you're an idiot. We're God's people. We're God's chosen people. Look at all those other people out there, how bad they are. We aren't perfect. We're better than them. So God pretty much has to choose us. And they were so absolutely convinced that God could not do anything except them that even when they were being hauled off to captivity as a result of God's judgment upon them, they still didn't get what Jeremiah was trying to tell them. That they had broken that first covenant that God had made with Abraham and that they had blatantly broken it and now they were going to be broken as a result of the consequences of what they had chosen to do. Jeremiah had a tough job telling the truth to a bunch of people who believed only lies. Sounds kind of contemporary, doesn't it, in so many ways. But that's the way that it was then. Martin Luther, 1,500 years later, 2,000 years later, in 1,500 it sort of experienced the same thing. He was a part of a church that had 
turned its back on the principles of God. Turned its back on the principles of faith. Turned its back on the principles of the way that we come to God as the way the Scripture would describe it. And he had become so upset with what was going on that he wrote out 95 things that he wanted to debate with the leaders of the church over what they were doing wrong. One of the main things that they were doing wrong was they were selling indulgences. Now, how would you like to be able to do that? If you give me 50 bucks, I'll write you out a little thing that says you can tell your wife a lie. For 100 bucks, well, we might do a little bit more. You know, they were auctioning off those kinds of things. And what were they doing? Well, they were building the church treasury. But they were leading the people so far away from God that Martin Luther just couldn't stand it anymore. It was awful. It was an abomination. And therefore, he took it upon himself to point out 95 things that he wanted to debate with the leaders of the church And he nailed them on the door, wrote them out, and nailed them on the door of the church where he was the pastor. As a result, a lot of things changed. A lot of things were turned upside down. It was a tumultuous time. If you remember, we did the little series back on the Sunday evenings about how, in many ways, it changed everything as far as our modern life is concerned. But ultimately, it changed how we understand our relationship with God. You see, uh, you, you, in Jeremiah, and then, of course, Liam read the Apostle Paul as he was writing there in the book of Romans, uh, those same type of foundational truths, and then ultimately, Martin Luther, as he came and as he shared those wonderful things that had been so much a part of his, uh, a part of his consciousness, He understood and they all understood the fact that that ultimately we have to come to God on God's terms. We can't think our way to God. We can't work our way to God. We have to come to God the way that God wants us to come to Him. And what does that mean? No boasting. No pride. Humility. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I don't deserve anything but God's judgment. That's what I deserve. But when I come to God and confess my sin and my need for Him, then we receive the blessing of God. We receive forgiveness. We receive grace. Even back in Jeremiah's day, what, how does he talk about the fact we're not going to have to worry about putting out a, a list of Ten Commandments. I'm giving it to my people now and they're going to write it on their hearts. So you don't have to go to a, to a lesson to learn. It's already here. And when you humble yourself, I'll forgive your sin. Remember your sin no more. Paul talked about it in terms as far as the, as the church was concerned that yes, the, the fact that, that we come to God on faith, the people of God come by faith and faith alone. And the bottom line of faith is that we're all sinners, that we all stand in need of God's grace. We all need forgiveness. None of us can come to God from a position of boasting, well, look how good I am. Look at all these things I've done. Or look at all these things I don't do. Whatever you're trying to do to try and twist God's arm, God doesn't have an arm you can twist. He doesn't respond to that. God always responds, though, to those who are humble in heart and humble in spirit. And that is something that speaks to the depth of the commitment that we must make that as we understand God's role in our world and in our lives, we cannot be arrogant and expect to have God's presence and God's blessing. Human arrogance and a relationship with God 
are like oil and water. They don't mix. They can't mix. Because how does God respond to us? It's always through God's grace. It's always through God giving to us as we are humble and as we ask for God's blessing. That is how we receive. That is how we have the opportunity to have a relationship with God. You see, there's so much around us that, that, that plays to our human pride. Uh, nowadays, we have lots of folks who are atheists or agnostics, and all they're trying to say is, I'm just too smart to believe in God. I'm just too smart to believe in God. Now, how are you going to have any type of relationship with God when you think along those lines? Because you're cutting yourself off from those lines of communication. The way to receive God, the way to have a relationship with God is based solely and completely upon our willingness to understand that we are sinners who receive God's blessing, who receive God's grace. Nothing earned on our part. Nothing at all. It is all a gift of God. In fact, I think that that uh, speaks so much to the heart of, of who we have to be. We, we have to embrace this view of ourselves from God's perspective. God created us. God knows who we are. We might think we can fool God by thinking this or saying this or doing this and not doing that. Can't fool God. God knows everything. God knows who we are at the very core of our being. God knows who we are in the darkest midnight when we feel alone, when we're the most desperate. God knows who we are when we think that we're at the height of everything and everything is going wonderfully our way. God's not fool. God knows what's going on. And God wants nothing more than to have a life-changing relationship with us. But it cannot be on our terms. It's always on God's terms. It's always as a result of our trusting in Him and allowing Him to do His will in our hearts and in our lives. And then it is God working through us His will, those who are humble, those who are willing to allow Him into their hearts and into their lives. And in fact, the hymn writer put it like this. He said, I sought the Lord, and afterward I knew that He was the one who moved my soul to look after Him. It's like the Scripture says, when you go to the Lord, you say, well, I'm, I'm accepting Jesus. And when you walk in, you turn around and you look over the back of the door that you walked in, and it says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. God is always seeking us. God is always wanting to have a relationship with us. But God will not step in and, 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 and break your free will. God will not make you become a child of God. God will readily receive with wide open arms anyone, anytime, who humbles themselves and asks for forgiveness. You see, faith is not really a vic victory over our doubts, over our concerns, over our objections. Faith really is simply surrendering our hearts and our minds and our wills to a loving, all-powerful God. Yes, certainly we understand that we find God because God finds us. The old bumper sticker when I was growing up said, I found it. That was supposed to get folks to knock on your window and say, what did you find? You need to share Jesus with them. A real bumper sticker should say, God found me. God found me. When we understand that fundamentally, it changes everything. It changes our outlook, not only on ourselves, it changes how we view those around us. It changes how we view God. It changes how we view and how we do church. 
It changes how we live with everyone around us because we see ourselves through the eyes of God. That we are God's creation. That we are those who are recipients of grace. And if we receive God's grace, then we need to be what? Grace givers. Not judgment dispensing people. Grace givers. Because God has forgiven us, we forgive. Because God has shown us how to love and care for those, uh, for each of us, God wants us to love and care in the same way for those that are around us. A total, total change from the idea that, well, I keep this big list of stuff here, and I'm doing so well that God has to bless me. Folks, that's a lie. It's always been a lie. And it's still a lie. The way to find God is to open your heart and realize that God's wanting to find you. He's wanting to work in your heart and in your life. And the way that He works in your heart and in your life is when we're humble and open our hearts and allow Him to do His work. Let's stand for a moment of prayer. And as we do, we'd ask that our musicians would come. Heavenly Father, again, this day, we know that we stand on the backs, on the shoulders of believers who have followed you through the days in the Old Testament, all the way up through the 2,000 years of church and Christian history. And Lord, we give thanks to the way that you have chosen to work in the lives of those who have been faithful to responding to your call. And we ask, O Lord, this day, that we would continue to follow you in a way that would be pleasing to you, in a way that would allow your spirit to lead us and guide us. Lord, we pray if there is anyone who has never received you, that today they would open their heart, confess their sin, and ask your forgiveness. Lord, we know that it's a simple phrase, yet it has the power to open us up to your power and your presence, the power of this universe and beyond. And Lord, we pray that you would work in each of our hearts and lives this day in accordance to your will, through Jesus Christ. Amen. These next moments as we're standing, we're going to turn in our hymnals to hymn number 300, and we're going to sing our closing hymn, I'll Tell the World That I'm a Christian. But as we sing this day, I would encourage you not simply to uh, begin thinking about what you're going to have for lunch today or what you're going to do this afternoon or what you're going to dress up for for Halloween, uh, but to use this as a time to respond to the voice of God. I don't know what's going on in your heart and in your life, and I really don't need to. God does. You use these next moments to respond to the voice of God as he has spoken to you. I'll be at the front to help anyone who has need of making any type of public commitment. But you use these next moments responsibly as we respond to the voice of God.
chose to worship with us this day. Uh, before we close, I'm going to ask Tyler if he'll come forward. Uh, we have a certificate that we want to present to him. We know you won't ever forget this day, but uh, we have a little certificate here for you to help remind you of the commitment that you've made and God's blessing upon your life. And I'm going to ask Tyler if he will to walk out with me in just a minute. I know Mr. Kent's got something to say. Uh, if he'll walk out to the front and uh, give you all a chance to hug him again. All right, Kent? Um, this month is a pastor, pastor Appreciation Month, and we've been trying to give you guys uh, a little gift from the church, but you were gone last week, Dave, and, and um, so we decided to do it right here at the end. We didn't forget you, Dave. But, um, but we wanted to say thank you for what both of you guys mean to us at Chabron Baptist and what you do for us. We appreciate your service and dedication. And this is just a little token of our appreciation to to both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. We certainly in church. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, you all are a blessing to us and uh, giving us an opportunity and a place to serve the Lord. Um, now let's bow for a word of benediction, and I'm going to ask Tyler if he'll walk out with me. Lord, we are grateful once again for the opportunity that you give us of worship. Particularly special days like today when we have the opportunity and the joy to celebrate baptism. We thank you as well for the opportunity this day to remember uh, the uh, commitment of our forebearers. And Lord, now we pray that as we leave this place that we would go uh, empowered to serve you in the places of responsibility that you have given us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all and go in peace.